Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for spending Saturday, after, Saturday morning trapped in a room with us talking about college ratings and rankings. Um, I'm Holly Hacker from the Dallas Morning News. Yes, this is Dallas in September. Get used to it. Um, and so we are going to be talking about, I don't know if you guys are like me, but I sort of love to hate college ratings and rankings. Raise your hand if you've ever gotten, like I did once, the, the press release from the college saying we went from number 73 to number 68 in U.S. News. We are on the way, on the move. Um, anyhow, yes. So uh, we're going to have Michelle Asha Cooper here from Institute for Higher Education Policy, fresh back from vacation on Jamaica, mm -hmm. and learning that on Tuesday the U.S. News rankings will be coming out. So hold your breaths for that. Uh, we've got... And she's gonna, yeah, talking about kind of the overview. Terry Hartle from American Council on Education, getting into some of the challenges and concerns that the um, Obama administration faces as it considers ways to rate colleges. And then we've got Kim Clark from Money Magazine, who has got her own presentation of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And she's going to talk about um, stuff she learned along the way doing a system for Money Magazine. So we will get started, give folks about 10 minutes each, and we still get our full hour, so make sure you have lots of questions at the end. All right, good morning. And technically, I'm still on vacation until September 11th. I just did a detour to spend my Saturday morning with you all oh, in, nice. Dal <laughs> oh, nice. in Dallas. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to start off with, um, I'm going to jump start the conversation, and I have three questions to uh, jump start it. And the first is, how did we get here? Why are we spending so much time talking about rankings and ratings that we would devote a session to it on a Saturday morning. And the second thing I want to tackle is really what is the difference between a ranking and a rating? And then third, to uh, say, uh, ask the question, will any of this make a difference in terms of student outcomes anyhow? So just jumping straight in, how did we get here? So we heard a little bit from uh, Ted Mitchell this morning, and he kind of gave us some, some indication of how we got here. But essentially, there has been this push for greater transparency, uh, greater accountability in higher education for quite some time. And this conversation is not new, and I'm sitting next to Terry Hartle, who's been a veteran in the higher education world for quite some time, so he's actually been a part of this conversation for a while. But it does seem like it's escalating uh, in the current current sense. And I think that it's escalating for three reasons, and I kind of just want to share my opinion about why I think that's happened. And the first has to deal with that there is an erosion of the public confidence in higher education. Last year, the Gallup Association did a, a survey, uh, and in that survey, they found that 97% of the respondents, is that better? 97% uh, of the respondents believe that a post-secondary degree or credential is absolutely essential for being successful in society, but they had concerns about the academic quality of the educational experience at public and private institutions as well as community colleges and online universities. So there is this, uh, this, this agreement among the public that higher education is important, but concerns about quality. The second issue is related to college affordability. And that same 97% that found college to be important, 74% of them said that they felt that college was unaffordable. So you have this situation where there's a squeeze, where people are feeling that college is absolutely essential, but on the other hand, they can't really uh, find ways to afford it. And then when you look at the whole affordability issue, you can't look at it without considering that the uh, price of college increases each and every year. And as Ted Mitchell said, there's the state disinvestment in higher education. 48 out of the 50 states have done so in previous years. And the federal student loan debt right now, on average, for students is hovering around $26,000. So all of that is a true affordability issue. And then the third issue relates to degree attainment and workforce readiness. So certainly, you've heard the news about the push to have more college uh, graduates, more people with degrees, and the reason for that is because more and more employers are saying that, that there is this need to have uh, college-educated workers, either with a degree or, or a credential, uh, in the workforce. But they're also saying that many of the students who are graduating with degrees are not yet ready for the jobs when they arrive. And so there's been this push from the workforce community uh, that has been one that has led to this conversation. So we're here today because academic quality, 
college affordability, and the challenges around degree attainment and workforce readiness, my opinion. Uh, so with that said, I'd also, I think it's fair to say that the higher education community has heard those cries and has been responsive in many ways. Um, so we've seen things like the voluntary framework for accountability, the voluntary system of accountability, college results online, a number of things have been uh, put into the discussion in order to help with this issue of accountability and transparency. But apparently the Obama administration felt like it was not enough uh, and it was not moving quick enough and so they have introduced this issue around the college rating system. Uh, it's called post-secondary institution rating system, to be exact. Um, as, as Ted Mitchell said, a draft version is intended to be released this fall. It has two purposes. One purpose is related to consumer information, and the second it is, uh, is around institutional accountability. Uh, and I think one of the questions that came up is around tying it to the receipt of federal financial aid has been something that the Obama administration said that they wish to, um, or they hope to do. Um, that remains to be seen in the future. So that's how we got here. So the next thing is, what's the difference between a ranking and a rating? And I think this is an important distinction because there's so much conversation right now around rankings and ratings that I feel like the terms are being used synonymously when there really are different terms. Um, right now we are in ranking season, for example. So, you know, two weeks ago or maybe three weeks ago, Washington Monthly came out with its rankings. Money Magazine came out with its rankings. I've been told that next week, U.S. News and World Report's coming out with their rankings. New York Times coming out with this, their rankings. The Obama administration's coming out with its ratings. So rankings, ratings is the talk of the fall. Um, and right now, there is um, just some understanding about what does it mean to be a ranking. So a ranking is when you rank order institutions based on some type of a numerical calculation. You're putting things into a sortable order. Uh, a rating, on the other hand, is when you're creating some broad categories. And the Department of Education has been pretty explicit in saying that they're attempting to create a rating system, not a ranking system. They are not trying to put institutions in some type of numerical order. Um, rating systems are pretty common already. We use them probably weekly without even recognizing it. If you go to the movies and you decide whether you want to see a G movie, a PG, PG-13, or R, that's a rating system. Um, if you go and book a hotel, as I did with vacation, you're looking at the hotel stars system. Um, and then even with vehicles, there are a, a rating system around uh, good, acceptable, and uh, poor and fair quality with uh, vehicles. So rating systems are pretty common in, in everyday life. And also there's been some precedents already through the, the, the Department of Health and Human Services. They have a rating system for nursing homes, I've been told. So um, this can be done and has been done. Um, the question is whether or not it will be done well and will it make a difference anyhow? So that's my third point. Will this make a difference anyhow? So before I get into will it make a difference anyhow, I think it's fair to say and appropriate to say that I do support the college rating system in theory. Um, I do believe that college ratings can make a difference, but in order for it to make that difference, I think that there are some considerations that need to be taken very, very seriously. And if we don't take those uh, considerations very seriously at a minimum, I think that the ratings conversations will run the risk of creating more noise in the space instead of actually helping students to gain the type of outcomes that we all hope that they will ultimately achieve as a result of this. So I'll just run through those quickly and then turn it over to Terry who will talk a little bit more about some of these challenges. But um, my first one is really that there should be two separate rating systems. I think, it's, I think it's going to be confusing as well as very difficult to have a rating system that does uh, information, consumer, provides consumer information, and then another one that provides accountability doing the same thing at one time. So I think there needs to be two separate ratings, one for information and one for accountability purposes. Um, I think that's the first thing. The second thing is we do have this concern about data, and there does need to be better data. 
But I do think that we can begin with the data that we have. After all, when we look at all of the rankings that are already out there now, they seem to be using some data. Um, and I think we can start there. But that is not to say that the data concerns are not very real. They are very real. We do need to give it full consideration. And we need to make sure that as we approach this exercise in ratings that we are fully aware of the limitations that we have regarding the data. The third thing is I think that a ranking system, a rating system, must appropriately recognize the diversity of institutions, the diversity of institutional missions, and the diversity of students who attend these different institutions. Uh, organizations, um, institutional membership organizations like APLU and ASCU that represent the public institutions, uh, and NAFIO, which represents historically black colleges and universities, have issued um, some statements and some papers about how to take these different types of institutions and missions into consideration, and so I think they're worth looking at. Um, but I do think that that is an important consideration uh, to be looked at. And then the fourth thing is that you know, at, at my organization, the Institute for Higher Education Policy, our focus is on low income, moderate income, and underrepresented students. And to me, for this to be very useful and effective for these students in particular, then we have to take into consideration the types of information that matters most to them. The information that we currently have in many of these rankings is just absolutely not relevant to these students. And so if we try to replicate the rating system by using these same type of measures and metrics, then we run the risk of creating another instrument that is actually not very useful for the populations of interest, uh, at least the populations of interest <coughs> for, for me. Uh, students who tend to be low income, underrepresented students make their college choices based on the realities of their lives, and it has been to focus on three kinds of factors. One is affordability, one is location, and the third happens to be around the flexibility of cor course offerings and schedules. So that question came up a little while ago in the last session around students who are um, location and place bound. My friend over here from Austin asked that question. So those are some real realities that we have to, to remember, and also, the, the issue around creating another website, I don't know what version or what kind of mechanism that the rating system is going to be introduced in, but if it's another website, then that poses a number of challenges just because that's not really the best way to reach students these days, and I think we have to remember that. And then my fifth and final point is um, this before something to this effect, these ratings go um, into widespread dissemination and and use, I do think that it has to be scaled. And certainly, uh, Ted Mitchell said that they're introducing the 1.0 version. Um, and I take the department at its word that they're using this as a draft and will appreciate comments on it. But this does have to be something that is scaled and thought about very thoughtfully at each and every uh, phase of the process before we start imposing it on institutions nationwide. So with that said, <coughs> turn it over. Thank you very much, and thanks um, for inviting me to be here um, with you in uh, lovely uh, Dallas in September. Um, uh, I think the weather in Washington is pretty bad at this time of the year, but this uh, really <laughs> takes the cake. Okay. Um, Happy to help. <laughs> uh, let me um, uh, thank you again for, for having me to be here. Uh, I think uh, Michelle's point about the difference between rating and ranking is very important to keep in mind in this. Um, the way I usually describe it is that a ranking is 1 to 100, a rating uh, is A, B, C, D, F. Um, that's the simplest way to think about it. And I think for institutions, one of the worries is if you get a C from the U.S. Department of Education based on data that is questionable, um, it is probably a problem for the institution. I think that's the reason that so many institutions are um, watching this uh, very uneasily as the department moves forward. Let me start by noting um, this uh, proposal was not the Department of Education's idea. Um, this was a proposal that was developed in the White House about a year ago. Uh, in fact, as it was being developed, the Department of Education staff said to the White House very clearly, you know, this is hard. This is not something we can do quickly or easily, and the department's uh, uh, objections were presumably heard, um, but uh, the administration decided to go ahead. 
So the Department of Ed is now faced with the task of implementing this idea uh, in a short time frame. So you've got hard and short time frame. It's a very bad situation for any federal agency to be uh, in, especially when the constituent groups you deal with, in that case this would be institutions, see this as being a very high stakes outcome. Um, that is the situation the Department of Education finds themselves in. Um, I think um, they are trying very, very hard to figure out the best way to do this, um, but as I repeatedly said, it's hard. Uh, I think the department has four big challenges in putting this together, and some of this will slightly overlap what Michelle has said. First, uncertainty about the purpose. What is the purpose of this? Is this about in consumer information, or is this about accountability? Um, the department uh, is somewhat challenged because whenever the president talks about it, he says it's about both consumer information and accountability. These are different things. Consumer information is something that helps people make a choice about what institutions to select. Um, basically what you're looking for is something that's clear, easy to interpret, and widely available. The Department of Education and the federal government already do a fair amount of consumer information. They do the college scorecard um, uh, at the White House and they do College Navigator. Um, how would a third system differ from those two? Um, accountability is very different. Accountability is about values. Accountability is what do we want institutions to be doing. Example, imagine two institutions. One institution has a 90% graduation rate and enrolls 20% Pell Grant recipients. Other institution has a 40% uh, graduation rate and enrolls 80% Pell Grant recipients. Which school would you rate more highly? Those are the issues that you get into when you're talking about accountability. You're making value decisions about what it is we want and expect institutions uh, to pursue. It may be that the department will try to develop um, two separate systems, one for accountability, one for information. Um, that may well be more uh, elegant in terms of the, the sort of development of a system, um, but it also just adds to the confusion. Um, then we have two federal mm -hmm. rating systems, uh, not one. Second issue uh, facing the Department of Education is doing this, and I underscore, I'm not criticizing the department, I'm just simply saying this is what they have to encounter as they put this forward. Uh, second issue is uh, data quality and availability. Um, the Department of Education gets a ton of data every year from colleges and universities through the iPads survey. Uh, unfortunately, much of that isn't on point um, for developing a rating system. Um, if you look at the oldest of the ranking systems, U.S. News and World Report, um, there's a data set that U.S. News and World Report developed with institutions um, specifically for the purposes of that rating system. Um, it's designed to ensure that the rating system has data that are relevant. Department of Ed doesn't really have this. The sort of data that the department wants and needs would be, for example, retention and graduation rates. Federal retention and graduation rates are wildly inaccurate because they exclude any student who transfers. Second, the department would like to have really good earnings data. Um, they don't have really good earnings data. They have earnings data on student aid recipients uh, through the Internal Revenue Service, but if you didn't get federal student aid, they don't have earnings data. Uh, a third, they have loan default data. Uh, loan default data, institutional loan default data, uh, has the advantage of being relatively accurate, um, but it's a relatively weak read if you're trying to build a rating system um, based on uh, outcome information. The Department of Education can get better data, but they can't do it quickly. There's been a lot of talk about whether or not we should have a unit record system. As I mentioned, uh, U.S. News and World Report actually worked with the colleges and universities to develop something called the Common Data Set mm -hmm. um, that provides data just for that purpose. They can't get the data quickly, and they have to put this system in place very fast per the White House instructions. Donald Rumsfeld famously said, you go to war with the army you have, not the army you want. The Department of Education has to build this data system, this rating system, with the data they have, not the data they need. Um, and that complicates their effort. Uh, third point, 
peer groups. Uh, the White House has said they're going to compare institutions by peer institutions. They're going to measure them against comparable institutions. Question, how do you develop meaningful peer, peer groups for 6,000 institutions? Um, it's hard enough for people like Money Magazine that do rating systems to develop good peer groups, um, and they're dealing with a much smaller number of institutions. I used to work for Senator Kennedy, so I often think about these things in connection with Massachusetts. Um, in Massachusetts, uh, three schools, Berkeley College of Music, it is a conservatory. Olin College of Engineering, it is a 100% tuition-free engineering school, and Wellesley. Are they peer institutions? Well, yeah, kind of, because they're all private four-year liberal arts schools with roughly uh, comparable uh, enrollment levels. But do they do the same thing? Uh, no. Do they educate the same students? No. All institutions have peer groups. In fact, all institutions have two peer groups. Um, they have their real peer group, and then they have what they refer to as their aspirational peer group. In other words, it's who do we compete with for students, and it's who would we like to compete with for students? Where are we trying to get? Um, the peer group that institutions are put in for a federal rating system will have a great deal to do with how their rating turns out. So there, there will be a lot of institutions that will look at a rating system and will say, wait a minute, we are, should not be compared um, to that set of institutions for these reasons. The fourth reason this is hard is um, this is the Department of Education, um, so uh, the rating system they uh, create is likely to establish incentives, uh, and any rating system is going to create incentives if people take it seriously. Um, so you better make certain that the incentives that you're creating are the ones that you really want because you're going to get what you ask for. Um, it would be great to say we're just going to create a rating system with only positive incentives. Um, but any incentive taken too far um, has uh, negative consequences. For example, how do you get higher retention and graduation rates without diminishing access? Mm -hmm. um, how do you get higher retention and graduation rates for Pell Grant recipients um, without encouraging institutions to go out of their way to um, recruit and uh, attract certain kinds of Pell Grant students, um, i.e. those who have been uh, well prepared academically, um, uh, and expressing less interest in those who haven't been so well prepared. Um, this is just a problem that any rating system has. This is not an issue particular to the Department of Education, as I've said. Um, these are uh, good people. They are uh, working very hard to implement a very hard task on a very short time frame. Um, and I can only say, um, uh, better them than me. <laughs> Great. Um, so I have a presentation, so I'm, I think I'm going to go up there so I can see what I'm doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all right. Hello, is this on? Yeah, okay, so. <coughs> Okay, so um, uh, my name is Kim Clark. I work for Money Magazine, and I spent many years uh, writing about rankings also for U.S. News and World Report. I was the lead higher ed reporter for U.S. News. I didn't actually do the rankings, but I wrote about them. And now I've spent the last almost a year creating a rankings for Money Magazine. So um, I learned a lot about how to make rankings. And um, so I thought I'd tell you the, the secrets behind uh, how do you make a rankings? And they're the dirty little secrets, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so first of all, you should know, I mean, any reporter here, on Tuesday you're gonna get the U.S. News and World Report, and if you're on the listserv, I think they've offered you an advanced embargo look, or um, somebody on the listserv can, can, can say, th there is a chance to look at that early. Secondly, Payscale is gonna come out the next day, uh, so you're gonna be really busy with the best, uh, schools with the best return on investment, so that's another sort of ranking. And of course, we, as we heard, uh, in the next couple months, maybe, we'll get the federal ratings, uh, version one. 
Um, okay, obviously I think that monies is better than all these, but there, here are some other ones. Uh, Washington Monthly came out a couple of weeks ago, Forbes, Forbes also, and Princeton Review also does surveys of students. So th these, are, these are other ones you should consider as you write about it. Okay, so um, I, see, I see Ted Mitchell is here, right? Yeah. So um, the data that we have to evaluate colleges on a mass basis is very poor. There isn't a lot of really good data. There's only a few data points that in my research I found that just about everybody agreed, okay, this is reasonable. And as you just heard, even Terry and other people are not crazy about some of these, but these are the best ones that I could find. The graduation rates, um, something called the student loan default risk index w in indicator, which is not actually the officially published default, cohort default numbers. This is a, an actual better number that was developed by a group called the Institute for College Access and Success, and I, I'm giving you a link to it later. And then, then the question of value add. I think that pretty much most people agree that some sort of value add test on some of these outcomes is a reasonable thing to do. So, um, so graduation rates, you've heard of the good and the bad. Uh, let's see. Um, somebody mentioned collegeresults.org. That's a really great site if you haven't looked at that. Uh, I'm just going to blow through this so you can ask questions. Uh, okay. They don't affect, they don't, as you, there's criticism about them because they don't reflect transfers and non traditional students and they don't take into a degree of difficulty. But in, from my research, they are really, I mean, they do take into account what, how freshmen behave, and if people are transferring out, to me, that's a sign that maybe your college is not doing a good job, uh, either in funding or engaging the students. So I think that tr a four- to six-year graduation rate is totally reasonable, and the data quality is, is pretty good. Um, okay, this thing called the Student Loan Default R Risk Index, or SLDRI, something like that. Um, uh, here's how you get it. Um, uh, you can get it for free. There's an explanation of how to calculate it from TICAS. And um, I'm just going to point out to Ted that if anyone who knows about data, the unit IDs which the iPads used are, don't necessarily match up with the indicators, the numbers that the student loan default people use. So it's, uh, it makes you crazy because you're trying to match up, make sure you have the right Loyola or whatever. So um, hopefully, hopefully you can fix that. So that it's terrible. It's, it takes weeks. Um, OK, so why is this good anyway? Um, it's a fair way to look at uh, what percentage of, uh, what, what your odds are of defaulting at that school. Uh, because the way the government publishes the default rate only says what percentage of people who are in repayment have defaulted. And if you have a school that happens to have a small number of borrowers, but a, a, a high number of those default, then it makes it look like you're very likely to default, whereas really, you know, only 1% of the students, let's say, borrow, so your odds of defaulting are quite low. So this is actually a better way to, better way to look at it. Um, also, you know, as we move into uh, more and more income-based repayment and that kind of thing, um, the question is, what, you know, why would anybody default? If you're on income-based repayment and you sign up for it and you have low income, your payment is zero, so you, you, would, never, you, you would never default. So, um, so that, to me, says if you have a high default rate and students have these options, that's a really bad sign for your college. So I, actually, I think it in a way makes, uh, makes the default rate even, even more interesting. Uh, okay, so value added. So, um, so most of us are English majors, right? We're not too good at doing regressions. Um, so I hired somebody. <laughs> uh, so, but you can do it. Uh, so all you do is you know, compare the, you get all the data about like percent of students with Pell Grants at each school and their graduation rate, and you figure out this formula, and you can figure out for every additional 1% of Pell Grants in your, uh, students in your student body, what did, how does that change your, your graduation rate? So you can actually sort of figure out, so if you have a high Pell Grant uh, population, you can figure out if this school is under or overperforming in terms of graduation rate compared to all other schools, or if you wanted to make, you know, you, you could make it public versus private. I mean, you could divide it however you wanted. So you could actually figure out, you can subtract out the, impact of Pell Grants on graduation rate, and you can figure out who's really outperforming. You can also use any other factor like gender, race. Um, we used SAT scores, which are highly correlated with uh, uh, socioeconomic status. So I mean, you can actually figure out how, how schools are doing uh, 
you know, w if they have taken a lot of disadvantaged students. So, so you can actually figure out who's doing a good job with that population group. Um, so, okay. Uh, value, it, va not everybody agrees that value added is, uh, is a good idea because uh, there's this question of bigotry of low expectations. I mean, if you're saying that, you know, we don't expect people, uh, you know, with this particular population to graduate, then, then you're kind of setting a low bar. And the question is whether you should be doing that. I, I think you should because the reality is that Pell Grant students don't graduate at a very high rate. So, I mean, that's reality. That's not setting expectations. That's reality. So, um, also, we talked about incentives. I mean, at, in, at Money, what we did was we raised the rankings of schools that outperformed in helping students with low, you know, with high, helping students that had Pell Grants and, and, and maybe, you know, not so good test scores. So, we encourage, I mean, the, the, the better a school does at that, the more they'll raise in the rankings, as opposed to U.S. News, where the more students they reject, the, the higher they go in the rankings. So, so we, we're trying to get to this, this incentive issue. So, okay. Okay, so we, we talked about how it's very hard to do these ratings and rankings because there's really not a lot of good data. There's no data on how much students are learning in college, none. Um, a few colleges, I think in Texas actually is one of the few places that does this. Um, there's something called the Collegiate Learning Assessment, which is, I guess, an essay test that people take um, after in their senior year. But Texas, I think, is one of the few places that requires colleges to make the results public. Am I, am I right on that? I know UT does. Right. Not, not everybody. So a lot of schools have this, and they don't release it to parents or students because I think they're embarrassed about the results. Um, so there's no good data on how much students are learning. And, and the CLA is not the only test. There, I think the ACT also has a test like this. So there is some data, but it's not public. Um, uh, okay, so instructor quality. We don't, there's no, we don't know how good the professors are. Um, there's one controversial number that my friend Scott will tell me how bad is a little later. Um, there's no information on how good a job the colleges do at getting students internships or how many internships are available. There's no good uh, data, there's no good survey data on what employers think about your local colleges. Um, nobody knows what percentage of pe college graduates are employed within six months. There is, I mean, somewhere there's that data, but it's not public. And um, um, there's no really good national survey of alumni satisfaction. So all the stuff that you would care about, there's actually no, no data on. Uh, there, so what people like me do is we find the ugly, and we, <laughs> we, we uh, try, to, try to say, well, it's sort of a proxy for the things you want to know. So, um, for example, how, how much in, you know, interaction are you going to get with your professor? Well, you can look at, like, student-to-faculty ratio. But at a lot of big universities, there's a lot of faculty that don't, don't really teach very much, so, and, you know, that maybe undergraduates have no connection with. So that's not really, I mean, it's the number that's available, but it's not really as good as you want it to be. Uh, for instructor quality, there's a site called RateMyProfessor.com where millions of students have gone on to rant about their professors or say how hot they are or how easy graders they are. Um, uh, so I got a lesson last night on how terrible that is. Um, I will say that the research shows that the ratings on Rate My Professor are very similar to the ratings that colleges get when they do internal um, professor reviews. So. We felt that it was not terrible. Maybe, maybe it is terrible. Um, uh, the other things you can, we, we, you can get like um, percent of classes with fewer than 20 students, but again, that may create a perverse incentive because there's all this evidence that these like flip classrooms are actually more effective in teaching, and they can have a large number of students and still do a really good job. Um, uh, we look at, yeah. Uh, I'll get into that later. I'll just move on. So. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, it, there's a lot of research that shows that uh, the quality of the peers that you hang out with really matter in your life when you're, you know, your college roommate, if he has a, if he's playing video games all day, your grades actually go down. So how do you get a, a view of college, you know, your peers? You can look at SAT scores or GPA of peers, but that's, you know, we all know that's not that great, but that's all that's available. And um, we do have, there are some numbers on college spending um, but those are very 
uh, poor, that you can't really tell how much the school is actually spending on instruction, and there's no evidence that spending more money actually results in higher quality. So uh, on affordability, uh, a lot of people, you know, talk about the sticker price, but as we all know that only 40-something percent of students pay the sticker price, and uh, the federal net prices, uh, the ones that are by income, are misleading because they only account for people who receive aid. Um, so those, like, people who earn $100,000, they have a certain net price, but a certain percentage of those are also paying full price, so that net price is, is all wrong. Uh, uh, other rankings, for example, only look at uh, need-based aid, and you really need to look at merit aid. And uh, oh, uh, schools uh, don't. If it's not federally required, you know, it, you can you can get the common data set, and schools are supposedly voluntarily filling that out, but they don't fill it out right, or they fill it out in a way that makes them look better than they really are, so it's not reliable. There's no auditing of any of this data. I think, Ted, there's no auditing even of the data that people report to the federal government, so uh, there have been some scandals about people finally admitting, oh, yeah, we, <laughs> we, we, we accept lots of students that have poor SAT scores. So, um, Okay, so outcomes is a huge issue. That's what we all want to know, right? So how do these students do once they graduate? And there, are, there is data. The Social Security Administration has earnings data. The IRS has earnings data. Um, some states um, have earnings data, but very little of it is being made public so far. Uh, there's only two sources of outcomes data. Uh, one is this company called payscale.com, which has uh, 1.4 million Americans have supposedly filled out their little surveys on that site um, and said what college they went to and what jobs they have. But it's self-reported. It doesn't include people who went to law school and make lots of money. So it's not, it's not very good, but it's all we have. And, and there was just a recent uh, paper out uh, from Brookings that said, well, it's not good, but it's not terrible. It's sort of acceptable. And then uh, 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 College Measures, which is um, uh, a joint project uh, of the American Institutes of Research, has gotten six states to release earnings data for each of their colleges, and Texas is one of them. Um, so that's actually, that's the best data because it includes all the data for all the students for all the colleges. But it's only, I think, first year data, is that right? It's only, only earnings after their first year, as I understand it, I think. Is that right? Somebody know? Anyway, so it, it's a problem because is that really the best way, you know, your earnings are right out of college? Is that the best way to judge the outcomes? I mean, that's, that's a real problem. Um, so, here are some people you can call. There is a person at the Department of Education who likes reporters, returns their calls, <laughs> and actually knows what she's talking about when it comes to data. She's just the loveliest person on the planet. I love her to death. Um, you can call me. All right. And uh, Bob Morse, I didn't call him, but he's a really great guy. He's happy to explain what he's doing. And uh, Robert Kelchin, who is sort of the brains behind the Washington Monthly Rankings, also a very nice guy, very happy to talk about it. So. Um, these are people you can call to ask about rankings. So that's, that's what I have. Wow. Kim, thank, I'm really depressed after hearing you say that. But I guess it's a good kind of depressed because then we can go into a discussion. So I, I just want to throw something out. And I'm, this was great. I can't believe we packed all this into you know, half an hour. We've still got 20 minutes left. So if what I'm hearing is, OK, the, the main reason you go to college is to learn stuff. We don't really even know how to measure what kids learn. There's all these gaps. What's keeping us from maybe before we go about doing even more rankings and ratings, actually trying to get some of this data that is presumably so important? Any any thoughts? Uh -huh. Or Ted Mitchell, please feel free to jump in because, <laughs> we, we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were talking earlier about what a hard job you have, so we were we were sympathizing. Um, yeah, anybody who wants to take a stab at that, you know, why, why don't we try to get better measures of this before we go around and rate with insufficient, incomplete data? I suppose it, it once again comes down to a question of values. Um, what are we valuing here? Is it we want students to earn more money? Is that the ultimate value? Um, okay. Um, how many years out of school do you want them to earn more money? One year out of school? Well, if you go to a for-profit school and you study HVAC, um, become an HVAC technician, that might be pretty good. Uh, you go to medical school, eh, not so good because then you're a resident. 
Um, is that the value that we want to uh, focus on? What happens if people go to specialized institutions where they're very clear that it's not about money? If you go to a seminary, a, a, a divinity school, a faith-based institutions where the uh, emphasis is most emphatically not on uh, getting more money. Um, what about the sort of civic benefits? You know, we often say that people who go to college um, are more likely to vote. The uh, good neighbor effects are, are very important. They're more socially engaged. How do we uh, weigh those sorts of things? Uh, Kim pointed out that there are some things like the collegiate learning assessment um, that try to get at post-college uh, activities. There are other things like the National Survey of yes. Student Engagement uh, that try to get uh, at some of these things, but they're different. They're done for different purposes and they reflect different values. Uh, ultimately, the challenge um, is with 6,000 institutions um, that do everything from Harvard Medical School to six-month for-profit schools um, doing HVAC, it's really hard to imagine a single set of outcome measures that will work equally well for all institutions. Um, and I don't know an easy way around that. Ted. So I first want to say yes to everything Terry has just said, and, and just because it's Terry, I'll say yes to everything that he said before I came, too. <laughs> yes. um, so, I th so take what Terry said about overall values, institutional values, and how we, how we think about value, uh, and then deepen it at the institutional level that at each of those 6,000 institutions, because of the way American higher education has evolved, every faculty member is responsible for determining outcomes for their course. So take what one might think of as a commodity course, Psych 1. Um, having a conversation about what every Psych 1 student should, and I'll use the K-12 language, know and be able to do um, would be a riot even within a single large state system, much less across systems, across states, across the country. So the hyper-decentralization of issues of academic quality and outcome make this one really, really, really challenging. And I'll just add to that, um, certainly agree with everything that's been already said um, to the point around what students need in terms of learning outcomes. Uh, to Ted's point, there is something called the degree qualifications profile. It's quite complicated still. Um, they're working out the kinks, and it's something that's being produced through the Lumina Foundation for Education with the assistance of four authors. And they have a version of that that's going to be coming out, I believe it's October 8th, that really looks at how do you assess what you should know at an associate's degree level versus a bachelor's degree level versus a master's uh, degree level and trying to answer some of those questions around outcomes um, and comparability of certain types of degree programs. But also, um, to your point around data, um, Holly, what we have done at IHEP is we, we spend a lot of time thinking about data. And so we have this uh, report called Mapping the Post-Secondary Data Domain, but I have a couple of copies of this two-page document where we've actually talked about the problems and the possibilities. And on the back of it, we have this grid. And it's like, the ask, ask questions of what do we need to know about higher education and how available are the data? And we have it color-coded to say what kinds of questions should we be asking? It's around access, it's around affordability, it's around outcomes, it's around completion. What do consumers need to know? What do policymakers need to know? What do institutional leaders need to know? And then over here, we have what's available in our current data sets. This is probably pretty far for you to see, but what's in green is what's currently available. <laughs> and not much you see here in green. A lot of yellow and red. Yellow orange. and red. Yellow means it's available with minor modifications. And red means it's not available at all in any national data sets. Ooh, and what's orange? Orange is available with major modifications. Wow. But this is a good chart of sheet, cheat sheet if you want to know what's available and what's not available and what could be made available with some, with some tweaks. And I can leave these um, for you all to take a look at. OK, yes, Scott. Um, I want to sort of push back on the underlying premise and suggest that journalists are actually headed in the wrong direction here. We constantly write about, oh my God, there's no information available. And so we've got to somehow help 
the distressed uh, student and parent, and I actually think we're encouraging the hysteria. Um, if you go to College Navigator, um, I'm going to actually do something very atypical for journalists and praise a, a education department source. <laughs> you can find a ton yes. of what we've been talking about. You can find graduation rates. You can find default rates. You can find loan rates. You can find average age aid by income, which Ed Writers was involved with making a more useful tool uh, recently. Um, a lot. And you can download the data in big lot, files. Yes. So I love a, it. Yes. A lot is there. And so when we keep writing stories about how there's no information there, I think we um, encourage hysteria rather than using good available resources. And I guess why it's a problem, so would you rent an apartment based on a rating? Would you buy shoes based on a rating? Um, we are encouraging this idea that you can do this in college. And why is it wrong? So let's take, say, um, Kim, who is a great reporter <laughs> and a, one of the best watchdogs on higher ed around. So, but let's look at Money Magazine, says Babson is the best college. So Babson is a very good college, and for some people with some business interests, it's good. A lot of people would tell you it's the worst place for a business major to go, that they would be better off at many other institutions. Isn't Webb the number two? So a, an ins, a, a University of Naval Architecture <laughs> is the number two. That does no good. Or then look at, say, Washington Monthly. Now, Washington Monthly does really good stuff, I think, from a public policy perspective, in that they highlight institutions that enroll a lot of Pell recipients. And that's great, and so, you know, the Ed Department should praise them, but they're actually misleading students. If you are a poor kid and you get into Harvard or UC Santa Barbara, Washington Monthly would tell you to go to UC Santa Barbara. And that's actually, in most cases, foolish because you'd get more money at Harvard and more resources at Harvard. UC Santa Barbara should be praised for what yeah. it's doing, but, but, the, but the problem, and this relates to Kim's and Washington Monthly, is U.S. News alternates between Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford. Yeah, one thing. If, but if you're going to do, if you're going to do a new one, you can't have those come out on top. <laughs> so those come out actually in the middle of the top ten of Kim's. Um, yeah. Well, but, I know. But, and I ter let's give Terry a chance to respond. But, but, to but just. But my plea to journalists is stop creating rankings. Stop treating them seriously. Um, we should demand that Kim be a watchdog. <laughs> 365 days a year. Um, and we're sending students the wrong messages. Terry. Um, obviously, the White House didn't talk to Scott before they decided they wanted a new uh, rating system. Um, I think Scott's pointed out something that is another challenge that the Department of Education faces in doing this, and that is what some people call face validity. Um, you can't have something that doesn't, especially if it's coming from the federal government, that doesn't intuitively make sense to people. Um, so they need something where it seems to feel about right. The department will have another challenge, which is that you cannot have certain types of institutions clustered at the bottom of your uh, rating system for political reasons. So putting this together involves all sorts of challenges. Um, several years ago, a U.S. News & World Report um, decided that Caltech was the best school in the nation. Um, Caltech is a world-class institution. It is a wonderful school but it's a pretty specialized school. Um, and by the way, Caltech never came back to the top again, so they must have, you know, yeah. Well, the question is the best school we, for whom? Uh, you know? Well, uh, for U.S. News and World Report readers, apparently. So, um, <laughs> uh, the so they changed the rating system because that wasn't a, didn't have the sort of validity they wanted it to have. Can I respond to Scott? And then Michelle, everyone's responding to Scott. Yeah, and I'll go, anyone right in the I'll audience want to respond to you? Okay, go so, ahead. Uh, Love Scott to death. <laughs> um, so um, we have to also, as reporters, have to acknowledge that institutions, colleges, and Ter Terry's a great guy, but they have been fighting accountability for years, fighting it tooth and nail. So a lot of this stuff we're having to get outside of the institutions because they refuse to provide accurate and honest information. And frankly, if you're borrowing a lot of money, you want to know how much you're going to make after graduation, whether or not you're going to pay that back. And one of the 
reasons that we did our rankings was because if you look at schools like, for example, Bennington, wonderful school, but they have, it's very expensive, and if you're borrowing to go to Bennington, you should know that those kids do not make a lot of money on graduation, and our ranking shows that. It's not about the quality, it's about, it's such a, an expensive investment now, we're looking at whether or not you're paying back your student loans and how much money you're making. So I'm not saying that this is the end all and be all, but I'm just saying if you're thinking about spending money on education, you need to think about it as a financial investment, as a financial you know, transaction. So w we did that, you know, whether or not we should have done it. I, I guess I would say it's true that within 20 or 30 places, there's almost no differences between our colleges. So, Michelle. And my only point is, you know, I agree with you, Scott, um, in terms of the information part of your statement. Uh, there's a lot of information out there. The problem is, is that the students who we need to get access to the information aren't using this information. Okay. So even with your point around mm -hmm. Money Magazine, mm -hmm. most low and moderate income yeah. kids aren't mm -hmm. looking yeah. at Money Magazine mm -hmm. to figure out what's the best value college mm -hmm. based on your definition of value. Mm -hmm. So whatever the department comes out with, my whole concern is, is it going to be user friendly? Because a lot of this information is really for data geeks like me who like to play around with spreadsheets. Right. Um, and is it going to be accessible? And is it going to tell the students information that they actually need to make a decision based on the realities of their lives? Yeah. And if it doesn't do that, then I do think that we've just created another instrument that just adds to the proliferation of rankings and ratings that's already out there and it does students absolutely no good. Yeah. And that's what I'm most worried about. Yeah. I want to hit on something Kim said too about the whole, you know, as you're pushing for the data, yes, there's data out there, um, but then, for instance, on graduation rates, there's still these standard, um, oh, okay, of those who were first time, full time, didn't transfer. Mm -hmm. Then if, they, if a college tells you this doesn't tell the whole story, then push them for the data that does tell the whole story. You know, you mentioned NESI, National Survey of Student Engagement, which is a survey of sort of students' experiences. It gets at that stuff in that black box during the four years of college or six years of college. A lot of schools will not release it. So ask them. When John Marcus and I were writing about um, net price, how much a certain defined subset of students pays um, after grants and scholarships, a lot of colleges would say, well, yeah, but you know, it doesn't include these kids and these kids, and what about that? Okay, fine, give us the data. One college offered up the data. So I would say, too, push back, and if they're telling you we don't have the full picture, then let us know what you do have, and if you're not providing it, then we should be writing about it. Yeah. Um, okay, more questions, yes? Oh, my God, where do we start? <laughs> you in the back, hide your hand, then we'll hit the short horn up here. Go ahead. Okay, so my viewpoint is kind of in between Scott's and Kim's. I mean, we have to have data. We have to have some sort of numbers for us to report on the rankings for everything. I think for me, what I see is that as long as there's sunshine on like where the data is coming from, but I think what needs to happen is also an encouragement of empowerment to students what questions should you be asking mm -hmm. the schools? What can you do to research it? You've got these numbers, now start calling schools. And it's like, how do we incorporate enough of those service pieces mm. that help them really get the information they need, not just what the ranking says? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there should be more personal. I mean, this is something we're working on is more, obviously, this is our ranking, but we should create a tool where you can look at the data and then make your own little ranking on something we're thinking about, so... Personalization is super important. Yeah. I agree. I, I love, by the way, that there are so many student journalists from UT Arlington Shorthorn, so let's mm -hmm. give them And not mic. one from SMU. Isn't that weird? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there is one? Okay. <laughs> My name is Hannah Floyd, and I'm with the Shorthorn. Um, I was asked, I'm wondering, what is the point of ranking co uh, these colleges if student success is two-thirds the student and we don't have comparable data to do so? And also, do these rankings uh, create... Um, do they create a consumer mentality in like millennials like myself, where if I go to the number one school, I'll be successful? Mm. Yeah, no, those are great questions, and you, uh, I, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it uh, definitely. I mean, it, it it creates a consumer. I mean, does it? Okay, so are we creating it or are we responding to it? I mean, college has gotten so expensive that we're treating it as a as a financial transaction because it is one. Um, but does that make it, do, do we accelerate, ex 
aggravate the problem, I, it's, it's possible we might. Can I totally be crazy and throw the question on, because you're college students, like people that we write about. What's the most important thing to you? I mean, when you're going to graduate from UT Arlington, tell me the one, you know, one thing that's your measure of success. What, what do you want? How should we be measuring schools like UT Arlington? Well, one of the weird things that we see, um, like at UTA, uh, we're ranked, I think, in the top 10 for diversity. Uh -huh. And I know that's something that brings like a lot of international students. I know we've got like a, over a thousand more like international students. I mean, I'm worried about how I'm going to pay back my debt. I mean, how I'm going to be able to pay back um, all the money that I've had to like, get in from loans to pay for my education. And hopefully I've gotten a good education. But a lot of the experience I've gotten has come from like working yeah. at the school, working as a student <laughs> journalist. So when I go to my like journalism classes, I already know everything whenever <laughs> I get there. I've just been working at this point. <laughs> So I, I have confidence to go out in the, f like in the field or to try to hang with some of the people in this room, hopefully. But um, just hopefully that when I get this degree, it'll push me to that next level to where I'll have that little piece of paper that says, hey, you can do this now. So. Just if you're going to be a journalist, do not judge your success in your first year salary. Right. My, my or, first. Or any job. Yeah, that's. I, I job. made seventeen thousand dollars a year in D.C. <laughs> my school would be an utter failure. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Oh my gosh. So many. Okay. Let's go over here. Oh, and tell us where you're from too. I forget to ask that you're supposed to state your affiliation, please. Jamal of uh correspondent uh, in D.C. with Thank you. Uh, diverse issues in higher education. Uh, the, the first question is for Terry and Ted. I was hoping to get a little more information on the um, idea of, of peer groups for the institutions uh, within the rating system. Um, if there's, there's a twofold purpose for the ratings, right? One is consumer information and, and the other is accountability. If it's for consumer information, I could envision something where institutions um, are, are, are paired or, or put with, with, within a peer group in a way that's kind of fluid. In other words, there could be different sets of criteria that determine uh, who peers are. Uh, but if it's for accountability, then it would have to be something that it seems a, a bit more fixed. Uh, so I was just hoping we can get some more uh, information on um, kind of the purpose of peer groups and what are the possible candidates for how peer groups might be set up. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the second question, if I may, is for uh, Michelle. I think you indicated that um, if, if this information is put out, um, that in terms of reaching students, a web page is not necessarily the best place to do it. And I guess I, I would agree insofar as, yeah, if it's the Department of Education web page, then maybe not. Um, but still, with the internet and the extent to which people rely upon it, I would be hard pressed to find something other than a web page. I guess the question would be not whether or not it should be a web page, but where that web page would be found. So maybe you could elaborate on that a bit. Thank you. Well, I too would like uh, some more information about peer groups, so perhaps I should just turn it over to Ted. Um, this is one of the issues that hasn't been talked about too much, but is one of the things that I am sure is. Um, really complicating the efforts of the Department of Education to figure out how to do this. Um, who do you compare schools to and how do you judge them? I think that the, uh, I mean, the Department of Education has some broad classifications that they have used for years, um, but those are probably not fine-grained enough for what it is that they have to do um, because you could be putting Williams and Amherst um, Wellesley and Smith um, in the same box with some thinly capitalized HBCUs that serve a very different student population. And uh, I'm sure the department doesn't want to do that, but how do you decide how to break that box of private liberal arts colleges? Just to use one example, how do you break that down into how many subcategories? I don't think, as you um, uh, suggested, that we can have the peer group categories change over time. I think they have to be pretty consistent because part of what the administration wants with this, I believe, is to drive institutional improvement, to force institutions to get better over time. And that means you need some stability in the structure. It means you can't change the schools, who you're comparing the schools to, 
without undermining this goal of continuous improvement. Unfortunately, it also means you can't add new data into the mix okay. because it means that the stuff you did before is not comparable. Mm -hmm. um, the Department of Education has collected data about colleges and universities um, for a century, um, but the Department of Education changed their data system dramatically in the early 1990s. So you can't compare institutions today using U.S. government data with where they were in the late 1980s. The data sets are just not comparable. This is a big part of this task that the department has to tackle in a very short order. The, if they were going to do this on a rational, logical basis, they would have designed a system they would have determined what data they needed for the system, they would have put the mechanisms in place to collect the data, and then they would have presented the ratings. Um, but politics is neither simple nor rational, and as I said, they're driven by it. This is time-driven. They need to have something, because the White House has promised it, uh, sooner rather than later, so it really precludes what any analyst like Michelle would tell you would be a rational approach um, to collecting the data. Um, Ted, it's a, he asked about your views on this. I don't know if you want to jump into this or just want to get into the wall. Are we, how are we on time? We have one more. One, okay. Well, we did, and then Jamal had asked one more question. Ted, we'll give you the last word because we're going to be watching what you're doing with all this. I want Michelle to tackle the question about, if not the website, okay. this will give you time to prepare your answer. So, Okay, okay. quickly. Um, so, Jamal, to the point about a website, what I, meant, what I should have said is probably I just don't want it to be just another website. So we already have College Navigator. We have College Scorecard. We have hundreds of websites. Um, and to the point that Scott was making, we have all this information out there on websites, but students aren't visiting those websites. So we need to figure out if it's going to be a site or whatever it's going to be, we need to have a dissemination strategy that will drive students to it. Like they need to be able to get to the information and know how to use the information so it's user friendly and it's accessible to them. I don't want it just to be another site that um, journalists and analysts click on and it doesn't actually provi provide any type of useful information to the people we most um, we really want to get to it. But to another point that was brought to my attention at breakfast this morning from uh, Kelsey Lynn from Boise, Idaho. Where's Kelsey Lynn? Is she in here? Kelsey Lynn, right there. Kelsey was telling me about how in Boise, Idaho, there is still a digital divide in the rural com communities of Idaho. We, you know, I think we all take for granted I have two cell phones, a laptop, an iPad, and a computer that I use all day, every day, that everyone's connected through some form or another. But it's really true that in a lot of communities, especially in rural communities, um, but also in other low-income communities, digital access is still not as pervasive as uh, we would probably like to believe that it is. Ted, would you, we, we we're running out of time. Any, any closing thoughts? Ted, thank you for spending time with us, too. Um, this is, it's great. And so my first closing thought is that um, Kelsey was on the search committee for a president of Occidental, uh, Occidental College once. And um, thank you, Kelsey. It was a, <laughs> it was a great thing. Um, so, uh, so these really are the issues, right? And I, I want to be really clear that um, I and we don't have a, a, a quibble with any of the issues that you presented today. Um, it uh, is causing me to sweat, not just because of the heat outside, but because these, <laughs> you know, these, these really are complicated, uh, complex issues, whether we're talking about data availability, whether we're talking about incentives, whether we're talking about the ways to get information to the students who most need it, uh, the ways to make sure that we're comparing uh, institutions to like institutions. Uh, um, the things we were talking about earlier this morning about making sure that the degree of difficulty is something that's me measurable and, and incorporated. And then this core idea of knowing at the beginning of the exercise that the proxies we're going to create for outcome are only partially uh, uh, resonant to the full range of outcomes that we desire uh, and students hopefully get uh, in, in, in a college experience. So um, I want to acknowledge the problems. I want to tell you that we're working hard on them. Uh, I want to invite any of you who have further ideas about how we could square some of these circles uh, to uh, give them to us. It's, it's you know, we're, we're, 
we're narrowing things down, but it's never it's never too late for that idea that breaks uh, that breaks a logjam. So I don't have any. Well, thank great. and thank you, everybody. This has been a great discussion. We should get a find a bar across the street and continue it yeah. later this afternoon. <laughs> so, thanks to our panelists. Thanks, Ted. All right. Thank you. Yeah.